As a British space scientist, we work a lot with NASA, so it's especially great to have you here. Over the years, I've worked at the Goddard Space Flight Centre, and we've even launched instruments on the Space Shuttle. And I looked up when UCL launched their instruments, so I'm a, I work at UCL, and we had instruments flying in 1983 and 1985. When was your first mission? My first mission was in 1986. So we just missed you. Just missed me. Just missed you. Like but I probably work with it, because I, I worked with crews from, uh, from the time we launched 1981 uh, up through beginning to train for my first flight in about 1984 and so my crew trained for two years. So that gives a sort of sense of time scale actually yeah. over which you need to build up the skills and expertise to exactly. become an astronaut. Yeah. So we've been gathering questions over Twitter, they've been coming in from across the country and I think we have to start with your experiences in space because you are a special NASA administrator because you have the astronaut experience yourself and we were getting questions around your experiences in space and about what it was like on the space shuttle. So we've heard a lot in recent weeks in Britain because we've had Tim Peake on the Tim space Peake. station, but you were working in the shuttle era. What was that like? Shuttle was a little bit different in that we were campers. Uh, that's the best way I like <laughs> to describe it. Tim is, a, is an, a, uh, an explorer, let me put it that way. So Tim's mission was like climbing Mount Everest, if you want to put it that way. It took a long time, six months, as a matter of fact, um, when I flew, my longest mission was nine days. That was typical for a space shuttle mission. We had crews of seven, anywhere from five to seven people. A typical crew was seven. Uh, and that gave us an opportunity to fly generally two extra people on a crew that we call, back then called payload specialists. And they were, as the name implies, people who were brought along for their very special expertise. Um, I flew four times on the space shuttle. My missions included... Uh, the very first flight was sort of a generic, we called it the end of year shuttle mission because it, it came, we actually were supposed to launch in December of 1985 and we ended up launching on the 12th of January 1986 and then flying for seven days. Um, we did a variety of experiments. My second flight, we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. So that came, uh, we actually had Challenger occur 10 days after my first flight. So we landed 10 days later, we lost Challenger and her crew. And that sort of sent NASA into a tailspin for a while until we were able to recover. But I flew my second flight in 1990, and that was when we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, which was absolutely incredible. And that, that's the uh, really famous space telescope that I'm sure everybody in here has heard about. Exactly. And you'll, you'll see the successor. I have some, some slides that I'm going to show you where you'll get to see the successor of, uh, of Hubble. Did I say James Webb before? Actually, the successor of Hubble. And uh, some of you will remember, most of you are too young, but uh, after we deployed Hubble, we found a slight error in the grinding on its mirror. And so we, NASA undertook a series of a little bit more than 10 years of five different missions back to Hubble to do install corrective optics and then install new instruments. And today, Hubble is a totally different uh, observatory, actually, than it was when we, when we deployed it the first time. And I, I use the term observatory. It's not a telescope. Uh, observatories are places where a number of telescopes go. Uh, Hubble is a series of instruments that uh, are housed in its body, so it's an observatory. Mm -hmm. Then my third flight was uh, a mission to planet Earth where we looked at Earth's atmosphere and the sun something in which you're interested. We had two, three solar experiments. And then my final flight was the first joint Russian-American shuttle mission uh, flown with Sergei Krikalov. And that was the beginning of a step away from just plain shuttle, where we started flying shuttle to the Russian space station Mir as a precursor to actually assembling a space station, which has now become the International Space Station. And out of all of your space trips, which one would you say was your favorite? That was another question. I don't have a in. favorite. I, you know, I, I get asked that question quite a bit. Um, each mission was uniquely different in its content. Uh, no two missions were alike. Um, I frequently flew with people with whom I had flown before. My first flight, Steve Hawley was a crew member of mine and we flew together on the Hubble mission. He actually was the person that physically moved it out with the remote manipulator system. Uh, Dr. Kathy Sullivan was a crew member with us on my second flight and then Kathy and I flew together on my third. And then Franklin Chang Diaz, who had been with me on my first flight, came back for my fourth, and we flew as crew members on the, on the first <laughs> joint Russian-American mission. Um, they all have different meanings. The, the one that, that is the most, um, um, I guess from a standpoint of something that, that I remember and cherish forever, 
uh, is my last flight because I knew it was my last flight. Mm -hmm. My family and I had decided that that was going to be it, that I was not going to fly again. Uh, my crew knew it. I'm, I'm not sure who else knew it. But every evolution we did was the last. And so from an, uh, I'm an emotional person, if you can't tell. And um, every evolution we did over that little bit more than a year of training was the, the last time I was going to do that particular thing. And that yeah. was hard. Oh, yeah. I, can, I can see the emotion. And yeah. I feel it as well myself. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I never tire of seeing the amazing yeah. views that the astronauts capture. Absolutely. That must really yeah. stay with you, looking back down towards planet Earth like that. Hey, we have an amazing planet. And um, one of the things that I hope the students, if they don't already know it, but will we'll glean from looking at some of the slides. And also, hopefully, you, you had an opportunity to pay attention to Tim during his six months on orbit. Um, what he did is nothing short of amazing. I mean, he was an explorer. He, he lived and worked on the International Space Station for six months. You can't fake it. You know, you can, for seven days in the space station, in the space shuttle, it's, it's pretty easy. You know, you can, you don't have to eat if you don't want to. You don't have to go to the bathroom if you don't want to. You can't fake that for six months. <laughs> you know, you, you've got to eat and you've got to figure out how to go to the bathroom. And do other you have to develop some sort of new normality uh, exactly, for you when you're exactly. on the space station. Yeah. But now for NASA is an incredibly exciting time because you're overseeing this transition where mm -hmm. commercial companies are taking up the launches into what we call low Earth orbit, which exactly. includes to the space station. And NASA has got really big aims, ambitious aims to go beyond. Could you tell us a, a bit about the future plans and where if, you want to if go? If you ask me where NASA is today, we're on a journey to Mars. And, and we are leading um, our international partners. And, and with the International Space Station, we have five different space agencies. NASA representing the United States, Roscosmos representing Russia, uh, the JAXA representing the Japanese uh, government and, and the Japanese Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and then the most massive, the largest group, is the European Space Agency, and that's 22 member nations of ESA, uh, of which the UK is one of those member nations. And, uh, and now we are starting to add what we call non-traditional partners. I, I just came back from a, a trip to the Middle East, and we have partners in Israel, Jordan, UAE, uh, on my way from here down to West Africa, to Niger, where we're going to begin to partner with another West African country that we've not partnered with before, so and it's, is, it's different. Is this international collaboration very important then, because the aims are so ambitious? I mean, I was we, we were seeing on Twitter people talking about going to Mars, but going back to the Moon, and yeah. perhaps even an asteroid as well. Could you tell yeah. us a bit about that? This seems very, very wild to yeah, me. Yeah, all of it's in the... We're on a journey to Mars, and if you think about just the, okay, for the kids, how many planets in our solar system? Somebody yell it out. I'm with you, whoever that <laughs> was, was that nine? said nine. Yeah, nine. Technically, to the people who want to be, you know, purist, supposedly there are eight, and then there is what we call a dwarf planet, Pluto. But I'm a big, Pluto is a planet person. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll see why. I have an image of Pluto. But, but let's say they're eight and a dwarf, or they're nine. Um, we now know that there are billions, literally billions of planets in the universe because every star that you look at in the sky today we believe has a planetary system around it. Uh, you as a solar physicist uh, understand all this stuff much better than I do. But we're on a, NASA's on a journey to Mars, leading our international partners to get there. And Mars is, we're the third planet from the sun, or the third rock. And then you go next out, and that's Mars. That's the fourth planet from the sun. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in between there. So we've got uh, asteroids that are in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And some of those asteroids don't behave. So they get in big elliptical orbits around the sun. And every once in a while, they'll cross Earth's path. And so... One of the things that we're concerned about is impacting Earth. So we actually have a mission that we call uh, OSIRIS-REx that we're going to launch this coming September. OSIRIS-REx is a robotic mission. It's actually going to rendezvous, going to intercept and rendezvous with an, an asteroid called Bennu. And it will land on Bennu, take samples, and then lift off again, come back to Earth. So it's going to launch uh, the end of 2016 and return to Earth seven years later in 2023 carrying samples from Bennu. Um, in the meantime, we've got a mission where we're going to start flying to the moon in a vehicle we call Orion. Um, it, it's launched on a space launch system, a heavy lift rocket, and we'll spend the decade of the 20s uh, flying again around our own moon. And, and that'll be a period of time in 
what we call cislunar space, the, the, the space between Earth and the moon and some distance out from the moon, even on the other mm -hmm. side. So we'll be operating there, and we hope to actually do another robotic mission that carries a giant boulder from an asteroid and slowly moves it over a couple of years such that the moon's gravity grabs it, pulls it in, and it becomes an artificial satellite of the moon. And then our astronauts will go and visit that, that asteroid, that rock, and uh, actually learn how to interact with it so that when we get to Mars and we begin to operate around Phobos and Deimos, which are two of the moons of Mars, that are very low gravity environments. We will have learned how you operate in a low gravity mm -hmm. environment. So a lot of things going on between now and the 2030s when we actually send humans to Mars. <laughs>